Get ready to meet the trailblazers driving the human change behind our clean energy future. This week, our trailblazer is Alejandro Agag, the pioneer of Formula E and Extreme E racing. A Spanish-born entrepreneur and bold visionary, Alejandro is disrupting the billion-dollar motor racing industry at the intersection of sport, science, and climate action. Meet this self-proclaimed practical environmentalist who is tearing up the motorsport rulebook in the name of equality and the environment. We believe conversations about our clean energy future should be as relevant around a kitchen or a classroom table as they are around boardrooms or political tables. We're here to fuel a new energy conversation, and it starts with you. Well, Alejandro, it is such a pleasure to have you joining us on this Trailblazer series. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. And I feel like you're a perfect fit for the name of this series because you've had such an unusual and trailblazing career. I'm interested, you went from politics in your native Spain to the world of Formula One. Now, in many ways, you're sort of an environmental activist pioneering, you know, Formula E and Extreme E, which we'll talk about later in our conversation. But can you talk us through the, the shape of your career? Was this always the grand master plan? Not really, no. Uh, it, it, there was not, not a master plan in, in my career. Um, what I really loved from the beginning was politics. So my big passion was politics. So when I was in university, I, uh, I started this kind of students association in my school. And then I very quickly went into uh, the youth organization of my political party at the time uh, when I was 18. So really my passion was politics. And um, I did politics for since I was 18 until I was 31. And actually, the plan was to continue in politics. And uh, the reason I stopped politics is because I got married. And when I got married, I actually got married with the daughter of my boss at the time in politics, uh, who was the prime minister of Spain. And I didn't want oh, the, wow. really the conflict of interest. No? And I decided to stop politics and, and just uh, look for another career. So that's how the master plan got uh, <laughs> changed to another plan. And yeah, and then I didn't really have a job. So I, I started uh, working on motorsport more by coincidence by, you know, I have a couple of friends in motorsport at the time and, and that's how it started. Right. And so tell me, I mean, I've heard it described you saying that it sort of became untenable at some point for you to continue in Formula One. Was this uh, an overnight decision? Was this something that sort of creeped up over time? Where did the transition out of Formula One come from? No, so when, when I stopped politics, I really started working in different areas, different buckets within the, let's say, Formula One world. I never worked directly for Formula One. Um, I I, um, I made it some deals with the Bernie Eccleston at the time on TV rights with Flavio Riatore. I had my own team in in GP2, and I had I had uh, did my my hand in different in different places. But at one point, I was working a lot with with sponsors and. One of the sponsors uh, uh, told me, listen, we, we have major kind of reservations because of the environmental uh, side of uh, motor racing and Formula One specifically. And then, and then at the time I thought, well, we have a problem because we, because this is only going to get bigger. I, I always thought, and this is probably around 15 years ago. And, you know, I always thought the environment was going to be a key uh, issue of the century. And, and uh, that only kind of like accelerated my belief that we needed to find some kind of green motorsport green solution for for uh for the future and that's really how we we i started uh, the idea of transitioning out of let's say traditional motorsport and to and to basically well go into a green one but as there was not a green one we basically had to create it so uh, then uh, we we started really uh at a dinner in paris um in uh, february 2011 um, and it was a small dinner at the restaurant in Paris. We were Jean Todd, who was the president of the Federation at the time, uh, and still is the president of the Federation, the FIA. Uh, Antonio Tajani, who was a former colleague of mine from politics, uh, who was at the time commissioner of industry of the European Union. So he was basically also in charge of the automotive industry uh, and myself. And at that, at that dinner, we spoke a lot about electrification, a lot about the change in the industry, a lot about how we would have to introduce greener and greener restrictions for for cars to be to be on the road and that's where the idea sparked and said let's do an electric car championship 
and it was Jean who said it, the president of the federation, said, Let's, we, we, FIA should have an, an electrical championship. And I said, I will do it because I believe in it. I've been thinking about, about it for a while and I would love to kind of put that together. Of course, that was the beginning. That was the idea. It was very difficult to make it a reality because many, many people thought it wasn't going to work. Uh, basically, everyone in the mm. motorsport world thought it wasn't going to work. Uh, at the time, I mean, it was kind of, you know, it's kind of difficult sometimes to think that everyone else is wrong and you're right. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's not so easy. But at the time, sometimes you need to do it. Sometimes, so I, at that time, I thought everyone else is wrong. I'm right. I'm going to do this. And yeah, luckily, it looks like at that time I was right. I got so many questions oh. I want to ask you about that, but the, the, I'm interested in that piece. How do you kind of maintain that resolve that you're the one that's right when everyone else is telling you you're wrong? What kind of was your point of truth or the thing that kept you on your journey? Because I imagine there was not only a lot of criticism, and we'll talk about that a little bit in detail later, but just the barriers that you would have over, had to overcome to make your idea a reality. What kept you going? Well, it was difficult. Some, some morning I said, we wake up and say, why should I continue trying this? Because, you know, everyone else thinks I'm completely mad. but. Um, what I believe was the, 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 the core idea was the right one. So the core idea was that the uh, environment and climate action was going to become more and more important. And if that was true, then this project made sense because this project was based on the promotion of electric cars and electric cars were going to be one of the many parts of the solution for climate action and for to sort out the, the problem. So that was really the, what kept me going, really the belief that the core idea was the right one and that people were not seeing it yet. Uh, some people were, but, but, you know, not that many. And, and, and especially in my environment, people were not seeing. Um, and then slowly more and more people, you know, joins. And we had some early, uh, 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 early supporters. Don't get me wrong. Some people did believe and some people even, I remember one of my first partners, Tag, Tag Hayward, the, 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 you know, the watch brand, um, <laughs> they said, listen, you may fail on this project, but we, if you fail, we want to fail with you because it's such a great project and such a great kind of, um, you know, try that we want to try with you even if you fail. So even some people that joined me were not sure that we were going to make it. But, um, but you know, those, those supporters were really, really important in the beginning. And then more and more people came on board. And then, um, yeah, and then, and then it became like a snowball. And then I think the key point was when I got two big uh, uh, American uh, investors and partners with me, Liberty Global and Discovery, once they invested in the company, then the kind of the ecosystem went like, well, this is not going to go bankrupt. So if it's not going to go bankrupt, it means it's going to exist. And if it's going to exist, I think we better join. And then kind of the whole thing became like a big snowball. Yeah, it's so interesting, that powerful tipping point where the ecosystem sort of became undeniable. I'm interested, I've heard you describe yourself as a new environmentalist. Do you remember the moment where this really clicked for you? Was there a single moment where you went, I really need to pay attention to this. This is something I need to devote my career and my life to. You know, uh, I think it's been a slow process. And um, even when I look, you know, I, I don't remember what I was exactly doing. I mean, I remember some of the things, but many of the things I've forgotten what I was exactly doing when I was a member of parliament in, in the European parliament. But I, I, not long ago, I went back to my record, but luckily everything stays on record and online to see what were the questions I was putting up to the European Commission as a member of parliament and so on and so forth. And quite a number of my questions already then, and these were talking uh, 99, so yeah, 22 years ago, were, um, were touching uh, issues of relating to the environment. So already then I was uh, obviously concerned about the environment, about the environmental measures and policies and so on. Um, I think through my time in Formula One, that kept growing. And uh, definitely when I started doing Formula E, obviously I started reading a lot more and learning a lot more and, and, and being informed about the real problem. Um, but I'm probably, I cannot define myself as an environmentalist. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm, I, if, if, if I was, I would be like a pragmatic kind of environmentalist. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into, into the real world and action. I, I am not so much into symbols and tokens and, and, you know, and not taking a plane to go on holiday and things like that. That's not my thing. My thing is making real big changes in industry, big, big changes in technology. So I guess in that sense, I'm not the usual environmentalist. Although I have to say those kind of, let's say, traditional or real environmentalists, as they call them, they're very necessary because they are the ones who enable mm -hmm. us practical environmentalists to kind of succeed in our business, no? I was going to say, do you think the world needs more pragmatic environmentalists? Are there enough people that are doing what you're seeking to do, which is getting in and driving those industry changes? 
I think the world needs that every everyone is a pragmatic environmentalist. I think uh, uh, that that is a key transformation. I think uh, every company, every industry, um, and every person needs to become a pragmatic uh, environmentalist. Um, the, the 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 other ones, the ones that sounded the alert and the alarm, uh, the 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 more kind of idealist are are fundamental. But we have we have brilliant uh, examples of those. You know, Greta Thunberg is one, or you know, many. Uh, but but practical environmentalists, people who just do business, they go get on with it and change their business to make it more sustainable. That's that's what we need on a massive scale. So let's talk about the the practical side of what you built with Formula E. What were the objectives that you decided to focus on when you started Formula E? What was the goal to prove? Because I know it was just more than having an exciting car race. Yeah, absolutely. So Formula E has a more kind of uh, specific scope, uh, uh, if you compare it to Extreme E in a way, um, which is to promote electric mobility, electric cars. So we, we, with Formula E, we identified a very specific problem linked to mobility, which is obviously transportation by road. Um, within that, another even narrower problem, which is transportation inside the cities. And mm -hmm. we think electric cars are the ideal solution for that problem. Maybe not at this point for going on long distances, although I think there will be very, very good options to go on long distances also on electric or electric uh, mixed with some other technology. Uh, but definitely inside the cities, electric cars are a priority and a solution now, not in the future, not no, now, even, even five years ago, they were already the solution. Why? Not only because of the CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions are an important factor on, on transportation and you have to eliminate them. But in cities, the main problem is not CO2 emissions, is the particles emission, the toxic particles, the NOx, all the other particles that come from the tailpipe of the car. That is a big problem because the health problem that we have in cities and the air that we breathe in cities is so polluted that it causes huge, huge uh, problems for society. And, you know, you may even be a climate change denier. Okay, fine, I'll take that. Don't believe in climate change. But who doesn't believe in, in pollution in cities, in the air? It's, it's impossible not to accept that. Um, even if you are the, the you know the, the the hardest climate change denier in the world, you you go to a city, any city in the world, uh, you know there are extreme cases, obviously in India or in China, which is improving a lot the quality of the air now because of electric car adoption, or Europe, or you go to cities. Paris has had big problems of of air pollution. London, we are choking in the city, so we need electric cars to basically clean the air inside the city. That was really the objective of Formula E to improve the technology, to change the perception of people about electric cars. And we are succeeding in that. The technology is improving massively. We have the generation three coming, which is going to be an incredible leap in terms of performance of these electric formula cars and so on and so forth. So that was really what we wanted to do with Formula E. And I think we, 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 we did pretty well with it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer to your question. Well and truly on the journey, absolutely. I'm interested for how the traditional industry responded to you, because one of the things that, that's been certainly forthcoming is, is criticism. Uh, I was reading one. I, I did want to quote it. I saw the Red Bull advisor, Helmut Mark, said, Formula E is only a marketing excuse for the automotive industry to distract from the diesel scandal. And I, I noted that your CEO came out and said you were flattered to have Formula One talking about you, uh, you know, uh, at all in any way, shape or form. Well, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we love this kind of uh, criticism. Um, which is, you know, which is what, what makes us uh, keep going, no? And of course, I know uh, Dr. Marco for many, many years. He's, he's what I would call a true old school race man. So he, he's been there for a long, long time. Um, he loves his racing and he sees it as a, as a threat, which is normal, you know. Uh, we are not a threat to motorsport. We're not a threat to racing. But, uh, and we would love Marco to join us. And I think he will end up joining us um, at some point. Um, and, you know, I would like that very much because I like him very much. Um, but, um, you know, I've had other very good friends of mine, for example, Gerard Berger. Gerard Berger is a former Ferrari Formula One driver, big champion, um, who was re running DTM. DTM is a German combustion championship um, with brands like Audi, BMW, Mercedes, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> used to race there. And uh, seven years ago, he was like making a lot of fun of me. And now he's going electric. So there you go. You know, in the beginning, we had a lot of that, but we just had to, you know, you smile and you keep going. Because if you think what you're doing is 
the right way, then, you know, at the end, they will, it will be them joining you, not you giving up. One of the things I wanted to ask you about on a personal level, because one of the themes of this series with trailblazers that we're talking to is when you go against the status quo, the, the world likes to let you know that. They like to make it hard. Criticism's forthcoming. People tell you you're crazy. What have you done as a leader, you know, personally, professionally, just to, to be able to be resilient through that, to make sure that doesn't take an overwhelming toll on you, and also to not allow that to affect your people too, because you've got a leadership role. You've kind of got to be the light that keeps telling people that they can keep going. How have you kind of taken that on yourself? I think you have to take uh, criticism as a motivation. And the harder the criticism, the, the bigger the motivation to prove everyone wrong. It's like I was saying, uh, sometimes it's okay to think that you are the only one who is right and everyone else is wrong. Um, the challenge comes with your people. You need to keep your people, because for me, it's not difficult. I'm just basically built like that. I don't really, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a phrase which is I couldn't care less. Uh, I, I, it actually helps me to have these people going against. Um, but, you know, it's not the same with people from your team. So you have to be really close to them and explain that things are fine. Uh, show them that, you know, their jobs are not in risk and that the, the project is the right one. Um, and, you know, you have sometimes, you know, 90% of the people are able to cope. You have a small percentage of people who, who really can't and then they should do something else. Uh, but, but you know, 90% of the people normally in the teams are, are ready to fight and ready to continue. And like I say, if the core idea is the right one and you think you're doing something even more, if you think you're doing something with purpose, um, it's fine. You just keep going. Don't listen too much to the people. Like I say, you can be the only one who is right. Oh, sorry, my dog is barking. You've already talked about kind of the, uh, no, you're all good. Uh, you, we've already talked about the kind of traditional old school racing crew that you touched on. When you built Formula E, there, you know, there's this whole argument that you're building for a totally new audience who aren't traditional fans of motorsport and uh, getting excited and energized by what it is you're creating. But you also very much have the opinion that motorsport will meet you where you are. You know, as you're saying, there's people who are, you know, very much skeptical a couple of years ago that have come on the journey. How have you thought about the audience and I guess almost who you win over and how you win over as kind of thinking through your innovation and progress? The audience, of course, what is, is the key because if you haven't got an audience, you cannot build a business. You build a business over, you know, having an audience, being able then to showcase what you're doing giving a platform for your partners and sponsors to showcase also what they're doing, tell the stories. So the audience is, 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 is the key, the cornerstone of everything. And when we started Formula E and now Extreme E, we thought we need a new audience. Uh, not that we don't want the old audience, we also want the old audience, but we want to bring new fans into motorsport. So if you look at the, the mix of audiences now in both, and while we don't have that much data on Extreme E because we only had to have one, one event, um, about half of the audience comes from traditional motorsport fans who enjoy the race um, and actually know about the drivers, know about the techniques of driving, know about technology in the cars and so on and so forth. The other 50% is new audience of younger generation that like the interact interaction, uh, they like the kind of digital side of it, they like the attack mode and all these new things. Some people call them gimmicks. I, I don't mind calling them gimmicks either, that we introduce into the race format uh, more to make it like a video game. And I think we have to go more into that direction to capture more of that younger audience. So it's really a combination of both. If you look at Extreme E, I think Extreme E is going to catch an even more radically different audience that eats into environment, eats into uh, uh, you know documentaries about science, eats into uh, also adventure. Mm -hmm. um, so Extreme E has a completely different kind of uh, uh, probably public than from Lei. And I think that's why both are really compatible. So to that end, for those who aren't familiar with Extreme E, you're one race in, talk to us about the vision for what that race is going to bring to the world. Yeah, so I, I, after um, creating from Lei, we, we thought, let's take this one step further. Let's go, uh, let's take the race to the most remote corners of the planet. Uh, and uh, let's showcase what's going on there with a race. Um, why? Uh, I always say, out of the 25 more watched for, uh, programs, TV programs ever, 24 have been about sport. Sport has a reach that nothing has. Sport unites different countries, different peoples. You know, you 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 uh, you have sport as an incredible platform. If you use that platform to send a message about the environment, you are 
uh, able to reach a much wider audience than strictly with a, with a science documentary. So we thought, let's create a sport that uses our huge power to send a message of climate action and, and sustainability. Of course, this is a theory, and we didn't know how it was going to work. We just, we just, again, we went ahead with it. And here the critics came, actually not that many, I have to be fair, but some critics came in the beginning from environmental organizations who said, yeah, but you're going to take big cars to, you know, uh, remote places that, uh, you know, nobody races there, and then you're going to break them down and whatnot. Okay, so, I mean, we had a little bit of that, not that much, actually. But anyway, um, we went ahead with the project. Uh, based on reality, like I say, and I always give the same example, cars cannot break sand, car, cars cannot break rocks. We, br- we, we race over sand and over rocks. So there's no damage there that can happen. You know, even, you know, perception is one thing, but reality is very strong. And we created a scientific committee that goes together with Extreme e, with five incredible scientists, some of the biggest experts from of the biggest uh, uh, universities in the world on specific topics that affect the areas where we race. And the first one was our desertification. We raced in Saudi Arabia, in the north of Saudi Arabia, in the desert there. And we brought some of our scientists there. And it was incredible what one of them said. He said, and it's one of the most eminent scientists in the world. He said, listen, I may write a science paper, and if a thousand people read it, I'm quite happy. Over this weekend, I've given more interviews and being quoted in more magazines around the world and more papers around the world than ever in my life. So clearly, Extreme E has given a platform for the scientists to spread a message. Because we had all these journalists there. They wouldn't have been there if Nico Rosberg, Jenson Button, Molly Taylor, Lewis Hamilton owning a team, and so wouldn't have been involved. But thanks to the strength and the power of these motorsport stars, we had all these journalists there, and they listened to the scientists that were with us. So that's that's in, in a nutshell, extreme. I love that. And I love this power of science and sport coming together. I, I wanted to ask you too, I know that you made mention of the fact you've built in some specific design features to the way that you've thought about Formula E and particularly extreme E to engage that next generation. Can you talk to us about some of those design choices that you built in to reach that even bigger audience? Design you mean in the car? Uh, does that mean more in terms of stuff like, you know, the social media feature with pole position, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the gender yeah, equality yeah. of the two drivers in the race? I thought that was really interesting. Absolutely. So there are different things in, in Formula E and in Extreme. In Formula E, for example, we, we, uh, we had this concept of fan boost where fans could vote online for their favorite drivers. And the ones who got more votes got a boost of energy during the race. So you could actually push your driver forward with votes uh, online. Or attack mode where you have an area a little bit like where the banana is on the Mario Kart video game, where you go out of the racing line, you go <laughs> over that, there's the sensor, and then you get four minutes of additional energy. We call that attack mode. Um, in Extreme, we have, well, obviously we have the race format, which I think is great. Um, for a long time, I've been also trying to bring more women into motorsport. Already 15 years ago, I had a Formula 3 team with two uh, female drivers. But the, the format is not the right one. Uh, when, when you have 20 men and only two women racing and, you know, it, it, it didn't work. I thought the best format was the one of the mixed doubles. And I always watching Wimbledon mixed doubles tennis, which is a man and a woman. And there, it doesn't matter who hits it harder. You know, in tennis, men hit it harder than women. But in mixed doubles, the women and the men are equally decisive and important for victory. And that's the, the format I wanted to introduce in Extreme. So now in Extreme, every race is, 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 is in competition by, by teams of one man, one woman. So it's exact uh, parity. And they're both equally important for racing. And you know, if, if the man does a fantastic lap, but the woman does a mistake, they lose. If the if woman does a fantastic lap and the man does a mistake, they lose. If they both race well, they win. You know, so they're both decisive. And that's why, and I think the first race with that format, which is the first format ever uh, to do that in, in motorsport, was uh, uh, in the desert last uh, two weeks ago. I think there was a, it was a fantastic success. And it really highlighted and gave a platform to these female stars to shine together with the big male stars. That's so exciting and awesome to see you pioneering a concept like that. I I loved the piece around, you know, the future of sport isn't segregated. And this idea of bringing uh, together this mixed doubles format, I think, is really interesting. You mentioned it's only the start of some of the experimentation you're thinking about. What can we expect next as you think about gamification going to the next level? Well, we're looking into different things. So, for example, already now we have something called grid play, where 
who choose the position of the final, fans vote for their favorite team, but only four teams are in the final. So then the other teams can give their votes to one of the four teams in the final. This allows for a lot of strategy and tactics because, of course, if, if they are comp competing for the whole overall championship, they will give the team, they will give their points to the team that is fighting with the one that is fighting with them and so on and so forth. So that can introduce a, a very interesting dynamic. I'm looking also to introduce a, a timed phase within the lab because in some of these places, there's a lot of dust. So once you fight three or four corners, then you're behind the dust and you have to slow down. Well, if you slow down, but then you can accelerate on a, on a, on a specific area and time that and chrono that, that could introduce another big element, like call it like the attack zone or something like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm working on, on different things that, that, that will make the game evolve. And definitely on the, on the video game side, we should really look, but we're, this is going to take a bit more time, maybe a year or two, because to create a video game, it's a, it's a longer process. Uh, but something that really brings or merges the reality with a video game, and, and we're working on different ideas on that. Awesome. I look forward to following the next stage of progress. I wanted to talk to you too about the significance of kind of having those established brands get involved in Formula E. There was, you know, a bit of speculation last year when a few big names decided to drop out of the Formula E world that that would spell the end of the race. And you were very strong in your your public comments saying, no, 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 no. You know, we need a world where they can exist, but this is about allowing for independent and new brands to come and play too. Can you talk us through navigating that and the, the role that some of those established companies bring in, I guess, giving confidence and credibility, but also that need to create a new ecosystem? Yes. So uh, in racing, you have basically two kinds of uh, competitors. You have the independents. So these are people who basically live for the race. Uh, independents can be, can be very big too. So you have independents like uh, people in the US like Anasi or like Andretti. You have independents like McLaren. But those are just their, their, their entities which their main purpose is racing. They just race. And then you have the car manufacturers, the big car manufacturers, the big brands that we all know, you know, from uh, Jaguar to uh, Nissan to Mercedes to Toyota to Porsche to all that. Those also go racing. But their main activity is not racing. Racing for them is a side activity. Their main activity, obviously, is selling cars to you, to me, to everyone. Um, and those have their own decision-making processes and their own kind of big marketing plans and so on and so forth. For me, any championship needs to be uh, designed to survive only with independence. Because you cannot, uh, and I'm not, I don't say this in a negative way, but you cannot depend on the manufacturers. Because the manufacturers don't depend on racing. The manufacturers depend on something else. Mm. If the manufacturers come, they're welcome. And in that sense, Formula E had the biggest run of manufacturers ever. To put it into context, Formula One has four manufacturers. Formula E has nine. So we had the likes of Porsche and uh, Jaguar and Nissan. So of the nine, two of them said well, they're not going to continue. Not because they didn't like Formula E, but because, well, obviously COVID had a big role to play because their sales went down and they had to cut budgets on marketing and this and that. Uh, but still another seven remain uh, in Formula E. But even if three or four of those would disappear, we have Formula E we're able to resist with independent teams. That is the key. And how you do that? Keeping the budget of the race low. You need to keep the budget of a racing team in a reasonable area where it can survive only with sponsorship. Because if you need a big injection of what's money... What's a reasonable from a area to too? Like so for those who wouldn't be for, familiar, what's kind of the range we're talking about? So for, for me, a reasonable area. So right now we are in uh, 15 million uh, a year, uh, 15 million dollars a year, which is a bit high for me. If I could, I would bring it down. Um, but it's okay, 15 million. When you look at Formula One, you're in the region of 200 to 500 million. So it's a lot bigger in Formula One. And when you're on Extreme E, and Extreme E, I think we're keeping it quite reasonable, you are in the region of 5 million to race a whole season. So that's kind of the three levels. 5 million for Extreme E, 15 million for Formula E, 200 million for Formula One. I wanted to, you touched on COVID there, and I, I wanted to ask you about that. You yourself got COVID. You're actually joining us from isolation at the moment due to a close contact, uh, you know, with travel on the weekend. Um, but you also had to condense, you know, six races down into nine days. Um, I'm interested in kind of your observations on the impact that COVID's had on Formula E and on Extreme E, because 
we're seeing in some countries and in some companies it kind of allowing environmental and sustainability objectives to be pushed to the side. And we're seeing in other instances it really forming the foundation of the plan to build back better and stronger. What's your observations on what it's done for your world? I think, well, COVID has been a huge challenge for, for motorsport uh, because uh, we, are, uh, we are an event business. We, we do events, basically races are events where public comes and watches the, 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 the sport. So basically we've, we've said goodbye to public. We haven't seen public for a long, long time. Um, no fans can come to the races. Uh, and, and that was very painful. We had to do a transition to make the races with no public. Um, and we had to decide, do we want to stop? Do we want to continue? We decided to continue. There was big demand from uh, the fans still to watch the sport through television. And, uh, and that's why we said, okay, let's do the races even without public just to show the, the show. And then we started organizing these races around the world. But it's a huge challenge because you need to put in place all these uh, safety protocols, which are completely logical to, to, to apply. Uh, I think in Rome, we tested, we, we did 12,000 PCRs to, to our ecosystem. And we were 3,000 people. We have reduced the ecosystem a lot, uh, but already, but, but still you need 3,000 people to, to put together a race like this. And that's on the reduced kind of uh, scale. Also for Extreme E, we are less people and Extreme E, it's a sport born almost by coincidence uh, for, for COVID times, because it's, it's a sport with no public. Uh, we go to these remote places and we, the, since the beginning, we never intended to have public. It's actually designed not to have public. But still, the ecosystem is around 500 people for a race. So that's a lot of testing, a lot of uh, quarantines before we go to the race. Some, you know, like Molly Taylor, uh, quarantine when they go back to Australia uh, and, and so on. So huge challenge. We've been able to, to navigate, but we cannot wait for the moment to, 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 for, for, to see the end. I mean, it's been like running uh, 100 meters with 100 kilos backpack uh, on, on our back. And hopefully now we can lose the backpack soon. Absolutely. The way that you talk about both the innovators' journey with Formula E and Extreme E and even getting through COVID, it just makes me feel like challenges are kind of, uh, to use well, certainly an Australian expression, water off a duck's back. They don't bother you too much. You almost use them as motivation. Um, what for you has been the most challenging moment of your career so far and what lessons has it taught you? Um, probably building Formula E was the most challenging uh, moment because building it, because there was so much... Uh, uh, kind of skepticism around it and, and, uh, and, you know, uh, kind of consensus, it would never happen. So that was very, very difficult to kind of convince people to, to join. Extreme has been difficult too, but, but a lot less because we had already the experience of Formula E and people had seen that we were able to, to make Formula E a reality. So they gave us a bit more uh, credit, but, but building Formula E was very, very difficult. There was one specific moment where we had already kind of, um, a battery. The battery is the biggest problem in all these competitions. The battery um, has very specific uh, kind of uh, temperature management situations. And, and, and you know, the, the battery of a, of a racing car is not the same as the battery of a normal uh, road car, electric road car. Um, and we were going to have a supplier and, and about 10 months before the first race, he, 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 he told us they were not able to do it. They were not able to, 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 to achieve that level of uh, performance and technology. And sorry, but they were abandoning the project. And I was like, oof. I had already the teams on board. I had sponsors on board. I had cities on board. I had all everything announced. And suddenly the battery, which is the heart of the project, disappeared. So that was a bad moment. But we were able to, again, to navigate the, the situation. We found another supplier. We delayed a few months. We, we, made it, we made it happen. So what have you learned as a leader? Like what kind of toolkit would you say are really important for those listening who are challenging themselves to be the change in their own organization or who are out there building businesses that are driving a different way, what advice would you offer about how to get through those challenges? Well, I just, the, the, the only kind of advice that I can give is a pretty, pretty simple one, I guess, is just keep pushing, you know? Um, I mean, you know, it's, it sounds a bit like a, you know, like one of these movies or these books of self, whatever, like, you know, you can do it, whatever. I mean, it's not that, but, but, it, but it is. I mean, you just have to, um, Keep going, even when you think that uh, everything is playing against you. Um, you you just keep going, and uh, and you know try to do it in a way that you know you don't annoy too many people, and try to get as many people uh, to support you as you can, and do it kind of you know in a I don't know humble way or kind of but but still keep keep going, and 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 uh, sometimes it happens, and then when it doesn't happen, you know accept failure and 
go on to the next, you know, because of course failure is a big part of any kind of uh, successful project, no? So, so, so we shouldn't be afraid of failure either. I wanted to ask you too, I mean, there's this whole through line of what you're talking about, which is, you know, the skeptics, the critics, the, the non-believers. What have you learned about how to convert them? What have you found resonates or eventually turns a skeptic into someone who believes and maybe even goes as far as becomes an advocate? So I, I think it's really important. I mean, there are two things, really. The, the first one is really try to not not to um, offend anyone on the way, because if you disagree with someone, but you don't offend them, uh, you know, you don't say, no, everyone that is not agreeing with me is stupid. No, that's not true. Maybe you are the one that is wrong. So you 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 have to, even when you have your own vision, you have to try to present it on a way that that doesn't offend anyone. Because then it will be easier for someone who has not been offended to join you. If you have offended someone, as a matter of principle, he will not turn around and say, okay, now I'm going to join this guy because he was right. He says, no, I don't care. Even if he was right, I felt offended at the time, then I don't want to join him. Um, and then second, you just you just do any, don't do anything else. Just 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 wait and try to try to succeed on your on your project. And then if your project becomes successful and people that were disagreeing, you you manage not to offend them at the time, and they see that the project is right that you were right. Then probably logically, if they're reasonable people, they will end up joining. I imagine one of the things too, you, you talked about the importance of the technology improving and almost, you know, the future becoming real in terms of the vision that you were a painting 22 years ago when you sat around a dinner table to the reality now. Can you talk us through just how much the technology has progressed? What, what is kind of your key point of data or the thing that you find most amazing about the progress that's been made in that time? Um, well, I, I'm always very ambitious. So for me, the technology has always been, it's always been, the progress is always too slow, if you if you ask me, and and the progress has been huge, but I would like to see a lot more progress. In in my field, uh, everything everything uh, turns around batteries, so we are in both Formula E and Extreme E, and now our new project uh, E One with electric power boats. Everything everything uh, turns around batteries, and since I arrived, batteries have probably multiplied by two, their their energy density, so their capacity. Um, and they have divided their cost by maybe two or even three. So there's been a huge progress. If you look at that, those are huge leaps, but they're not enough. Um, I would like to have something like, uh, like Moore's law in batteries. You know, uh, Moore's law is the law of, uh, of microchips, where microchips basically double their capacity every 18 months. And this, Moore invented the, the, this principle um, in the 1960s. Uh, and and this has been happening for decades, um, you know. And and when that happens, it's exponential. And and of course, the the our phone today, the capacity of this is bigger than 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 a computer that would occupy m rooms and rooms um, decades ago. Sadly, we don't have that speed of improvement in batteries. If someone cracks that, apart from becoming probably the richest man in the world. He will do a huge service to humanity because, you know, your phone, you will have to charge it once a month, but your car, you, you can go anywhere with your electric car, you know, and, and it will be a no brainer to buy an electric car. All cars in the world will become electric and so on and so forth. So, so that's really the big technology change that, that we need in my space that someone cracks a, a, a Moore's law for energy storage batteries or, or any other system. And we're obviously going to have a, a whole range of listeners here, some who have varying levels of knowledge of battery technology. What are the big barriers to making that real? Why is that so challenging? What needs to be conquered or solved to make that real? Well, the limitations on, on, on the... So here we're talking basically about energy density and then about other elements like temperature management of the battery and so on. And the, the limitations come from different uh, angles to, to batteries. Uh, obviously, the, the chemistry of the batteries uh, is is the key, and um, and um, of course the composition of the anode and the cathode and how you um, how you manage the the transition of the electrons from the battery uh, and how much store how much energy you can store in a, in a, in a, in a specific uh, volume of, of battery. There are very promising technologies, solid state technology uh, for batteries looks to me like the most promising kind of medium-term solution that could be practical on, on 
on cars and on different uh, 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 machines around the world. Um, and there are other technologies, lithium air and, and others that, you know, they're all evolved out of the chemistry that we put into that thing. There is also one of the big uh, disadvantages of batteries is that they use certain uh, elements that, um, that are toxic and that are also mined in places where mining has really uh, very, very uh, negative practices. Uh, uh, you know, uh, locations where they use uh, child slavery and uh, they use really bad conditions of, uh, for the mines and so on and so forth. We need to kind of try to go away from those elements. We're talking of cobalt, we're talking of uh, others that, 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 that really make batteries kind of a not ideal, you know, uh, solution in terms of the elements. But, you know, nobody's perfect and it's the best thing we have at the moment. So at the moment we have to work with what we have and it's much better to have an electric car than to have a combustion car, especially in a city. Hopefully batteries will, you know, will, will evolve uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a much cleaner direction and in a much more kind of uh, dense energy density, uh, higher energy density direction. So we can, we can charge our machines, our phones, our cars uh, more, uh, you know, on longer periods and we can have a lot, much longer lasting battery. Absolutely. Now, you've got a kind of 25 year exclusive license when it comes to Formula E. You're about six years into that journey. Where do you hope, where do you envisage that the industry itself, Formula E, but also where, you know, um, the, the motorsport game and perhaps, you know, mobility at large might be in tw- at, the, at the 25 year mark? Where do you hope things are? Well, I, I think mobility will, will uh, have obviously to evolve, you know. Uh, Mobility is one of the main sources of uh, CO2 emissions in the world, and that has to change. So from that starting uh, point, motorsport has a role to play. And uh, battery electric cars are not going to be the only part of the solution. I believe that a combination of technologies will, be, uh, will make a kind of uh, you know, uh, more comprehensive solution to the mobility problem. Electric battery cars will be one of them. Hybrid cars, improved combustion, uh, improved efficiency combustion will will still uh, play a key role because you know there are so many combustion cars in the world, uh, and uh, not all of them are going to change to electric uh, from one day to the next. So improving the combustion and the efficiency of combustion is going to play a big role of that. Hydrogen may play a big role of that, although hydrogen has a kind of serious efficiency problem at the moment. Um, but still, hydrogen can play a role in that, especially on longer distances, maybe on trucks, uh, maybe you know heavier, heavier uh, vehicles. So we need a combination of technology. And motorsport can help in every one of those technologies. We're talking also about synthetic fuels, although, again, the, the efficiency and the cost of synthetic fuels is very high. Um, but there are a number of technologies, and motorsport can help evolve all those technologies and make them ready for massive road adoption. That's awesome. And one of the things I read that I, I found quite interesting was that, you, you know, despite the perhaps different opinion amongst some in the community with regards to Formula One's view of Formula E, that you uh, certainly have a view that the future may well be a merger between those two. In fact, that may be one of the things that is ideal for progress. Why is that? Um, that's, that's, that's very much my own opinion. And again, here I'm probably on one of my moments of I'm on the only one right and everyone else is wrong because nobody thinks it's a good idea. Um, Specifically, our our main shareholders, both uh, Liberty Media and Liberty Global and Discovery, they they really don't think it's the moment to to merge the companies, uh, which is something that I, I, I'm always kind of in general putting out there as a as a as a good path for the future. You know, Formula One is the incumbent on racing, and they, it has a great history. Uh, but clearly, Formula A has a technology that is probably the future of uh, of racing. Um, putting those things together could could really organize kind of the whole motorsport for the next decades. Um, and uh, we are very compatible championships. Um, we could race some races together, some races separate. We could really promote the technology. Formula One could go on different technologies that also are sustainable. Uh, Formula A could improve a lot their, their electric battery technology. And then eventually Formula One could become electric because we have the exclusive license. So if, if they could not become electric unless we are together. Um, but having said that, that's one of the possibilities, one of the paths. It's a path that I would like, but I don't think it's a path that's going to happen. Uh, at least in the short term, um, but you know, I keep uh, I keep putting it out there just in case. <laughs> I like that. You got to keep challenging and pushing, don't you? And I know you mentioned already that you were talking about boats. I, I believe there, at least uh, in your mind, is is a view that hopefully one day it might take to the air as well. 
Yes, yes. Well, there is some people putting, trying to put a championship in the air too. Uh, I, I, mean, I got involved in the one of boats. Uh, I, I really don't have uh, more bandwidth to, to, to do more than that one. But, uh, but yeah, I think boats is the next, uh, the next frontier on electrification is going to be on boats, specifically on recreational on smaller boats in the beginning. Um, I think bigger ships and so on, they have other, other problems. And, you know, I, I'm very familiar with it now because uh, we have a big ship now with the Santa Elena, which is the one that the floating paddock of uh, Extreme E that takes the cars around the world. And it's very difficult to electrify a big ship. About 80% of the ship or 90% of the ship would have to be batteries. But on, on small recreational boats, I think the electrification is, is the, next, uh, the, next, the next thing that's going to happen. And I think having a championship like E1 on uh, electrification of boats uh, can, uh, can, can play a big role like Formula E did in, in its uh, moment or Extreme E is doing. And stepping back from mobility for a moment, you know, you, you've obviously spoken at the start of our conversation regarding everyone needing to be a pragmatic environmentalist and needing to see, you know, a greater level of seriousness and progress, you know, when it comes to uh, climate change and sustainability. What do you hope that we're going to see across the world, you know, within the next 25 years? I think we're going to see great things around the world uh, during the next 25 years. I'm very optimistic. I think uh, we have huge challenges. But uh, I think people are, have really now uh, understood that the problem is there. And, you know, yesterday even there was a, there was a summit uh, that led by President Biden of the United States, uh, great progress in the United States, by the way, on that direction, um, with other, many other leaders. And the progress, especially that you see in places from like China, for example, um, really um, makes us be uh, hopeful. I think technology is going to play a big role. I think technology is going to save the day, if you like, the next 25 years, because we're going to bring technologies that are going to, help a lot uh, fight this big problem. I think there is one key technology that has to be still created or developed. It's, it's, it's there, but we need to improve it. That will be the one that will be essential, which is carbon capture. So we need carbon capture technologies. We need to capture the carbon at source where it's produced, either in factories, either in energy power stations, either in cars, in trucks, in ships, but also we need to directly capture the carbon in the atmosphere and bring it back and, 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 and sequest, sequester the carbon and put it back under the earth. And those technologies will be the one that will help uh, uh, combat climate change. But without carbon capture, it's almost like, a, like a, an impo a very uphill battle because we can reduce emissions as much as we want, but the carbon that we have already emitted, it's already in the atmosphere and it's going to stay there for hundreds or thousands of years. It's not going anywhere. And maybe the trees, but but you know we don't have enough trees. So 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 carbon capture technology will be key in the future. But I, like I say, I think the next twenty five years are going to be brilliant. And I think the pandemic has accelerated change on the right direction. I love that optimism. That's so encouraging. I also wanted to ask you, given you spent the early part of your career in politics, very much been an industry in the commercial world since then. Where do you see leadership coming from? Where's the division of responsibility or who do you think will, you mentioned technology's central role, but how confident are you in political leadership? How big a role do you think leaders of industry and business are going to have to play? Uh, I think leadership has to come from both politics and business um, uh, and also social, uh, like civil society, the, 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 you know, just, just normal people also. And we see brilliant examples of, of that also around. So so I think liberty, leadership needs to come from, from maybe those three uh, elements. I think politicians need, obviously, to be the first ones out there. Um, but we have not to forget that politicians are the exact reflection of the people. Politicians are not like a species that come from another planet and they are politicians. No, politicians are people and they are elected by people. So, so you know, when people complain about politicians, they should be complaining about themselves because they are the ones who elect them. So... I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that too. I mean, they, there's a lot of conversations of leadership and that the leaders were better in the past and so on. But I guess 50 years ago, we were also saying that leaders were better in the past before 50 years ago. So, so no, I think in general, uh, you know, we will get the leaders we deserve. Hopefully they serve good ones and uh, they, they, they drive the right change. And speaking of leadership, how would you say your leadership has most significantly changed over your career? What's different to you as a leader now versus say the early days of when you were in politics? Well, um, of course, I learned so much, you know, uh, during all these years. So basically, uh, I, I learned uh, in, in the different uh, phases of my career so many lessons. So I try to apply them. Uh, but I, I have, you know, in, I have a, a, a way of running the companies that is very much. Uh, um, I mean, my, the, the the key way that I work is on delegating. So the key 
for me is to choose the right people and, and give them uh, as much responsibility as possible. And my role is really kind of a, a more of a coordinator and, and a uh, kind of, uh, I say, I see where we have to go and I, I point on the, on the direction and I say, let's keep going there. And I try for everyone to always keep going on that direction. But, but it's key to have a team that does the work because uh, first they can do things much better than I do on each specific area. And, um, and you need to delegate on them and give them enough responsibility. So that's kind of the way I work. And, 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 and for now it works well. And, and the people working with me, I think, you know, it's not for me to say, but I think they're happy. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's the way I think I will try to continue. And like I say, learning, learning along the way, which is, which is very important. Of course, I've made a lot less mistakes now on Extreme that I made on Formula E because on Formula E, we hadn't done it before. Now we've done it before. So of course you learn so much that then you apply to the next, uh, to the next phase. Absolutely. Alejandro, we've covered a lot in our conversation. Uh, you know, as, as we wrap up, I'm interested to ask you, you know, we've got a lot of listeners here who are passionate about taking on that responsibility. You said if leaders are a reflection of the people that they lead, then each and every one of us bears some responsibility for driving a better future. What takeaway or um, action would you love to leave people listening with today? What would you encourage them to think about, ask themselves, go away and do? Well, I, I think that for me, what we need in this time is action, not words, and also not criticism. So, um, you know, I, uh, it's something that annoys me a little. It's just that, the, and, and, and don't get me wrong, like we were talking before, critics are, are a great kind of motor and, 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 um, and they give a lot of energy and so on and so on, but uh, the useless criticism cannot replace action. So what I recommend to people is that they just do things and do things you can do in your normal life. Uh, you can, uh, you know, go by bicycle instead of taking a car or you can turn off the lights or you can change your diet if you like. Um, but, you know, do stuff. That's kind of the, the, that's kind of the bottom line. That's what we're trying to do in all our projects. We just get things done and we don't listen too much to who, to people who criticize. So don't waste your time criticizing and just do things. I love that. It comes back to where we started, which is that each of us should carry that responsibility of being a pragmatic environmentalist. And Alejandro, I'm certainly very grateful that you believed you were right when everyone else said you were wrong. Thank you so much for your trailblazing leadership. It's so exciting to see what you've already accomplished with Formula E and Extreme E. And I know I and, and everyone listening today will follow it with much interest as it develops and hopefully has this broader ripple effect in the way it inspires industry to innovate, to challenge, and to be a part of creating a better tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining us in this series. Thank you. Great talking to you. Thanks to EY for partnering with us to amplify people following the path of most resistance. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and subscribe to the series. Are you a trailblazer or inspired by a trailblazer? Leave a comment, let us know, join the movement.